If you want to ask a question, go to the bottom of your Zoom, Zoom screen and you should see a button Q&A. Go ahead and click on that and your Q&A window will open up and that is where we will read your questions and then we will try to answer these questions verbally uh, or we will answer the question via text. But one way or another, we will get to your questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, we'll, we'll plan for about 30 minutes of conversation. And if you have additional questions, please send them to our registrar. You have the email um, very handy on um, your registration um, email, and we will take it from there. So welcome, everybody. Thank you for staying with us. It's a little bit later than we thought, but that's how it goes when human beings gather. You know, we are not machines. We have um, organic open conversations, but let's keep to 30 minutes. And I would like to invite uh, Professor Minkins to open the session with a few comments about making the play, creating the framework. To me, the poignant question was, how long does it take for a curse to die? Very poignant, very powerful. So, Andre? Well, uh, thank you guys for staying up and um, watching this. Um, this is just the first um, incarnation of it. Um, I have, there's so many plays, so many stories that um, I had to just whittle everything, the information down to. Um, been living with this play for more than a year as far as the information and, and, and the research and the journals I plowed through and the fact that I wanted to use a, as a um, as a devised theater piece I wanted to make sure that I used the words of real people that were involved and um, and without naming a lot of names in some other instances um, I you know I really wanted to capture their daily lives and fortunately the Moravians left a lot of notes you know everybody had to keep a journal a diary and it was read upon their passing, uh, some poignant, poignant parts of their lives. And um, it's just fascinating to, mm -hmm. to, to hear them speaking in those terms from, you know, I mind uh, from seven, from 1735 to 1840 mm -hmm. something. It's like, it's like, wow, I just looked mm -hmm. at a hundred years of, of a group of a person's lives and mm -hmm. some of the lives that they only spoke of when it comes to Abraham and Peter Oliver and mm -hmm. all of those persons, um, I didn't even get to uh, to really sit with some of the African American voices in their own voice, um, but knowing the things about them uh, and the fact that when I still had hair at twenty something, I actually played uh, a Peter Oliver character for Old Salem, mm -hmm. uh, not knowing that this would come full circle, you know. Um, I don't know where the pictures are in the archive, Eric, but if um, I, I'll look through and see if I, I can find myself again. I've seen myself before, and it kind of caught me off guard. <laughs> you know, Andre, I can tell you, you are a serious student of words because that if I, I could just, I was hearing footnotes throughout your, you did a, such a fabulous job of knitting those actual words in the records. And the words were crafted in different vignettes for different audiences. And yet what you did was pull them out mm -hmm. and drew the humanity story between mm -hmm. all of those. Mm -hmm. You gave agency to people who may have only been given mm -hmm. a passing footnote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in a sum, you, you, you created um, um, a different glimpse of our humanity mm -hmm. through that. And I mm -hmm. appreciate that so much. That was a mm -hmm. very, very moving mm -hmm. assemblage of words. We thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Eric. I saw that uh, Matthew is back with us. Good evening again, Matthew. Um, I know there was, um, there were some, we, we got a version that was not quite complete. There were a few songs missing, um, it looked like, right? And there were possibly um, scenes missing. And I know that Matthew had prepared um, also a story for that. So Matthew, would you like to also, before we get into the first question that we got, say a few words, what the production meant to you. There was quite a bit of information shared about um, um, Cherokee um, and other native um, peoples. 
and before you get started, I hate to interrupt, but mm -hmm. the story that Matthew told about the, the he told me about the was it the turtle in the in the eagle or the bird? Uh, the uh, the turtle and the quail, the yeah. partridge. Right, and that story is going to end up in the video probably by Friday. Um, mm -hmm. My editor just got overwhelmed, and there were some things that he wanted to add. Uh, and he didn't quite understand what tonight was. He just heard a conference, but he didn't know that this was a world premiere of a piece that gonna, that's going to be a larger piece. And uh, and so that story will be in um, in the film version of this um, in the next couple of days. Mm -hmm. Okay, Matthew, so shall we, we would love to hear from you. I thought the dialogue between uh, Eric, the, Eric, just Mr. Williams and Mr. Uh, uh, your, your, your father and, and, the, the, and the, the fellow who was walking through all of, and a fantastic actor because he was given such passion to the different disciplines of the intellectualization of racism yeah. uh, that has, that have haunted so many of our thinkings and they and they show up in all these corners of human endeavor that have this racial twinge to them that we don't think about until we start adding them all together and you see a pattern mm. that's holding us there mm. thank you eric can we kind of loop back to matthew please that's great man mm -hmm. thank you okay. anybody else got anything otherwise forever hold your peace <laughs> before i get started <laughs> please <laughs> <laughs> um i enjoyed the film it was or the play um it was very interesting um to actually get to uh to hear some accounts of missionary native rea uh, relations mm -hmm. um, usually we get a very broad um generalization of missionaries come in mm -hmm. native americans mm -hmm. conversion you know um, there was some things in it, uh, about the, uh, the resistance, uh, mm -hmm. to the religion. Um, mm -hmm. and some of the, the things that I've read and I've learned is the conversion was quite easy for us uh, as Cherokee to, mm -hmm. uh, go into, uh, these other types of, uh, religions because our belief is in one spirit, one being, one mm -hmm. creator. Mm -hmm. So when we get the uh, the Moravians religion or Methodist or whatever denomination it is, it's all going to one deity. Mm -hmm. So the thought of one deity, and we believe in one deity, uh, it was easy for us to go into that. Uh, the the uh, the resistance I see is mm -hmm. also um, you got folks that are willing to. To go into the conversion, to go into um, into another another set of beliefs, but you also have another group that are very pure in what they believe, and they hold on to what they have been taught. And um, it's almost like the saying, "You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink." Um, I believe that was that resistance is a choice. We see that resistance with Dragon Canoe. Um, as he led the Chickamauga sect of the Cherokees, uh, he was very big in tradition. He didn't want anything to do with um, uh, Europeanized or colonized life. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, we got chiefs like um, um, Ostinaco and uh, Atacolacola. They were more than willing to live more peaceably and if that meant bringing in these types of beliefs, they were willing to do that. Um, you know, it, it was, it's a really big conflict, both spiritually and also you have the conflict of what's better for my people, what's better for uh, the end result. And I believe, well, I mean, I'm here. Uh, we've still got Cherokee here. So I believe those, deci those decisions throughout that time period uh, speaks volumes because although we have a uh, majority of us have a Baptist background um, now on, on boundary uh, we do have folks that still practice traditional ways so 
it's still, you know, it's still there, the our culture. And that was, I believe, one of Dragon Canoe's worries, as well as many others, is how do we keep our culture alive? How do we keep our culture intact? Um, and, you know, keep it, keep it pure and keep it here. Um, so there, there's a lot of, a lot of working cogs and, you know, about like a clock that we're, that we're working on that. Um, but to listen to this, it was, it was really interesting. Uh, I liked it. I, I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we look forward to, um, to seeing the second version with a story yeah. you, you, sh you chose to share which um, will show more light on that. And in the play, Andre, you clearly talked about the need for uncomfortable dialogues and you modeled for us how you can have that dialogue both within a particular group as in the scenes between the, the teacher and the board member and the student. And Matthew, you showed that the same kind of dialogues that happen between the missionaries and the settlers and the indigenous peoples and the African-American peoples also happened independently within the Cherokee community. And this kind of um, spectrum of choices is still very much here today. And it's still very much a part of the African-American community as well. And these divisions also show up within the white communities coming to terms with the, the, um, the history of colonialism versus co some yearning or some sense of what you, Matthew, called the purity, the purity of, of the message that people get by understanding there's only one creator for all that is created and, and how do we how do we sort between the purity and the pollution really? Mm -hmm. So we will continue this conversation. We will go very deeply into that tomorrow night. There are also two sessions tomorrow afternoon that will continue the conversation in our virtual walk and learn. But because of our limited time, I would like to shift um, to questions and um, there are two very, very interesting questions, and I will summarize them for both of you. And you might want to um, talk about that, um, um, both of you as well. So one question is, um, did you find that uh, the Moravian um, um, practice of enslavement was different from from that of slavery practices across the United States, and we can extend that. And that's really much debated in the scholarship, uh, Matthew, you know, where Cherokee slaveholders different from white slaveholders. It's very clear that indigenous peoples uh, learned chapel slavery from um, the white settlers as part of the civilization program, Andre, as you, pointed out and uh, related to that, perhaps a quick fact question, how many um, slaves and slave bodies did uh, the Moravians in total um, have? And um, also then maybe Matthew, you wanna speak about Cherokee uh, slaveholdership um, in that. And one other question about Islam, I brought that up earlier today, we know that enslaved people, some of them were fully literate. There were uh, many, many were multilingual, many different African languages, possibly for some Arabic, German, for sure. Um, and um, indigenous languages, they picked up Cherokee pretty quickly um, when, they, when they were on Cherokee plantations. So Islam, is that a player in this, in this unfolding history? So how many slaves were the Moravians, different slaveholders, were the Cherokee, different kind of slaveholders? What about Islam? It's a lot, but it's all fascinating. Well, I do want to say that uh, because in this presentation, I wanted to be careful about uh, authenticity, but um, I'm going to find a way to get to Cherokee or bring Matthew to end to have lunch. And I want to add, uh, those conversations that, that, the, uh, that the Cherokee might have been having amongst themselves. Matthew's got to help me find some Cherokee actors so I can make this work. Um, so, um, because I do want to have that 
I want them to have that discussion. And, and Matthew would have been a part of the live show in a, in a more mm -hmm. poignant way as well. You know, and music would have been all throughout. Uh, so especially on this parts where we talked about the division and the, and the, and the uh, unity that, that uh, the Cherokees did share with some of those um, uh, Moravian friends. So some of the Moravians moved, actually moved to the territory with the Native Americans, maybe not in the same fashion, but once they got to Oklahoma or one of those other states, some of the Moravians did go there and stay, you know, and moved there for a while. Some came back to, to Salem, but some stayed. So, uh, so I did want to explore that a little bit and to deal with the, um, with the fact that the Cherokee had relationships with, uh, with enslaved Africans that, and even free uh, Negroes, they had uh, relationships. And there are obviously also some, um, some bloodlines that African-Americans have that go back to Cherokee uh, um, origin as well. Uh, as far as, my, as, far as the, the Islam question, you just want me to do more research is what it sounds like. Because now I have to find that link and I know it's there. Uh, so if you, who, whoever asked that question, if you know of those links that, um, that you know, have occurred and uh, things that you can you know, let, share with me and areas I can go to to look, you know, to look on, at that to see how, how impactful it might have been in North Carolina, because that's what this story pretty much, you know, it, its roots are in the fact that coming from other places, they came to North Carolina and, and had to live together and form uh, formulate these relationships and deal with, I mean, because I didn't realize that the road that goes past that tavern or went past that tavern, it was a main artery at that time. And people running from, this, from, from the Revolutionary War where, you know, Cornwallis was coming up through the coast, were running up that road to escape from, you know, when South Carolina was getting bombarded at one time. Um, so, and then they would leave and come, leave Virginia or wherever they had gone and come back through there to go back to their farms or wherever they were going back to with their with their family and their slaves so so i mean so everything was brought to salem's door and there was so much more that they could have you know been a part of but like we said in the in the piece they almost got their land taken away twice because of not appearing to be american enough in those ways yeah thank you very much matthew you want to build on Andre's comments and, and, and tell us what, what your thoughts are about these questions. Uh, well, about the, uh, the slave holder um, mm -hmm. question, um, we've practiced slavery even before European contact um, because a lot of things you need to keep in, uh, take into consideration is our, we don't get along with our neighbors sometimes. And such as we are, we might have a back and forth. So whenever we would go to war, we would capture young men or women and bring them back as um, laborers. But a majority of the time, when these folk, these uh, folks that were enslaved, would join, uh, come into Cherokee towns. Uh, the beloved women would choose where these people went. Let's say there was a uh, recent uh, young wife who had lost her husband in a fight, in a battle. And that enslaved person could be given to her. And from there, a relationship would incur, uh, not, not necessarily right off, but it would build up to that. And they would then become a replacement in a way to fill in that gap to where her husband was taken out so untimely. Um, maybe a mother lost her son and, or a daughter, and that person that they bring into the towns would thus become that person again. Uh, it's almost, I don't want to say incarnation exactly, but it kind of plays in that because they're come. It's like they're coming back, but in a different form. They're taking place of that individual that had died, and in most cases, uh, these folks were treated so well that they didn't want to leave if we released them. 
Now that was at the before European contact. We get into contact and then we go in to see how Europeans treat slaves. We see that and it's almost an example. It's almost showing you, okay, well, that's how we need to do it now. And by the 1800s, um, majority of the slaveholders were not even full uh, blooded Cherokee. They were uh, mixed with white, white blood and Cherokee blood, um, like James Van. He wasn't a full blood Cherokee, uh, but he was a slaveholder and he was a vicious slaveholder. Mm. Um, he was a drunkard. Um, he, he wasn't really a good man at all. Um, but again, you kind of see the, the colonized coming in yeah. to the, into the, into the way that the slaves are treated. Mm -hmm. It is a, you know, it is a, a very intoxicating um, thing to, you know, to want wealth. And at that time, having wealth, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. had to have workers that mm -hmm. would really you know, run your farm, uh, you know, get, get your product out. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it was, you know, it was what it was at that time. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, you, and you're right, some people did take it to the, you know, to such extremes and were very cruel. Um, and then other times, it was just a matter of trying to survive until this country saw the light to say, okay, enough of this. Uh, we don't need to be doing this anymore. In mm -hmm. the Caribbean, I found that the Caribbean was, you know, they got their freedom in eighteen in the thirties, like thirty years mm -hmm. prior to, to mm -hmm. the so. mm -hmm. And we will go in depth with the Caribbean case study with uh, Dr. Vinell Curtin Roberts uh, presentation on Friday. So you can see how I like the image, Andre, of Salem being a crossroads mm -hmm. and it extends really into every continent, it extends, well, into many continents. It extends to Africa, it extends in the Caribbean, it extends deep into Indian country, um, and it extends back to Europe and with the Moravian missions to Greenland, um, et cetera. So it is a crossroads. But I find really interesting also, Matthew, about um, the different models is um, that, uh, you know, what you said about, you said it's not quite incarnation, but it's a replacement of people who were lost in the, in the community. And then to move from that to learn that chattel slavery really took uh, white people to get into the community and teach it. So it's learned behavior, it's learned behavior. And, um, and so resistance, as we know from some research um, that has been done on the African-American enslaved, it's also resistance is something that was already in the culture because a lot of the, you know, you talk about some stories of, you know, of, of the enslaved who run away, who resist, who protect the women by taking an extra whipping. Um, so resistance and fighting back is also the role of warriors that were trained in their original African communities and they pass it on. So there is a cultural continuity in, in, in ways that, that the white people didn't see really. And so Matthew, when you talk about the continuity of spirituality and religion to the point that today there are many traditional practitioners, um, possibly even in the same family. So you have, in, in the same Cherokee family, you know, Cherokee Christians and you have Cherokee traditionalists. And the same way in the African American community, you have um, very Afrocentric spiritualities being very alive and very much practiced. And at the same time, you have a Christianity. So it survived um, Christian enslavers that survived the teaching of the curse of Ham and still have that purity um, of, of a Christian spirituality that is really powerful and strong. So that's, um, that, that's really a testimony to the human spirit and the ingenuity of keeping traditions alive and keeping a, a cultural tolerance uh, ethics alive that it could accommodate the good, the good of so many different teachings. Yeah, well, I found, I found it fascinating how much the Moravians influenced uh, so much of the world, you know, in that in those ways, you know. Mm -hmm. 
we're calling each other brothers and sisters, um, women's, uh, women speaking in services. Um, I mean, but once they got here, there were even some conflicts and in, in some of those things, you know. Mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah, so the, the forming of America had some very powerful voices guiding America in different ways that, you know, was, you know, they weren't, they weren't good ways for human beings and human spirits, but they might have been good for industry, you know, so that's um, what do you do if you are trying to, you know, create a, a country and the country has to have wealth, uh, well, you, you, you form rules and set boundaries so that, so that, that, that ship can sail in that, in that way, in that manner. Um, but there's, again, there's so many stories to tell from this. Mm -hmm. And, and then we, you know, with the the uh, the fact that we're living in the in the uh, in this uh, age of of being able to have these uncomfortable conversations and talking about you know, black lives and um, and I I you know it took a year to kind of really kind of realize it would probably wouldn't have gone in certain directions in April when we did it live the way that it can go now the way you know conversations that we can have now uh, so. Uh, that's why when I was writing the teacher's part, mm -hmm. uh, I was like, well, this is a, a good time to, to to talk about why these conversations need to be happening. Mm -hmm. We have people who are in denial that, you know, that everything's over on both sides and that there, mm -hmm. you know, that there, you know, shouldn't be conversations. Nobody, we should be revisiting this. And it's like, well, you, you know, you can't, you know, it, it runs a lot deeper than, you know, than what we mm -hmm. have been believe and once I got into mm -hmm. that that, mm -hmm. that research it, it took me all the way there into that wormhole that that rabbit hole and information just started piling up you know um, so I had to find a way to whittle it down so I'm I'm really excited about the possibilities and the different stories that can be told mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's um, maybe one one aspect we could discuss in closing we are almost running out of time. It was very moving for me to see so many young people voice these stories. And I know, and, and Matthew, you can speak to that, that indigenous communities here always act with a consciousness of taking care of the next generations. How will your own actions affect the young people, the, the people who are not even yet born? And so these uncomfortable conversations also lead to a different vision of what this country can be three generations from now seven generations from now and perhaps we can close tonight with both of you speaking to to the youth speaking to the children that are not yet born yeah you first okay all right well i i think that um i commend uh those 20 something and teenagers who decided that they were going to take to the streets and they were going to be heard. Uh, and there's a lot of pain still in the community from today's uh, news and, um, but not, you know, from, from my age group, not unexpected. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm thankful to them that they are, are, are forcing the hand of, of uh, authority and of um, people who are supposed to be the smart people in the community, in the in, in society, and say, "Let's stop and think about this, and and, and discuss this." Um, and you know, we don't need to belabor the point that we have uh, leadership that just doesn't get it. Uh, uh, the denouncing, the denouncing of the 1619 project was unnecessary and totally off the rails. And uh, because we have to have these conversations. Um, and I too am connected to that 1619 project because one of my ancestors were one of the indentured servants off that boat. So mm -hmm. um, being from Williamsburg, Virginia. So I, you know, so I, I do, you know, I do really want to make sure that we, if they want to change the history again, these, these children need to know the real history. And I'm glad that the, the, that the generation is out there now, the youth are out there now that I, I, um, I hope and, um, and pray that they will, you know, organize in fashion in a fashion that now will begin to get results and not just um 
what you you know what what you're feeling, but also what you're thinking. It should have it should be happening, and and what we can do. And um, and I think that the unborn children will have a you know will have a much pleasant experience on on the planet. So. Thank you, Matthew. I think you have the last word tonight. Yes. Come on, Pastor. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I might be the only one on this panel that can say this. I, I don't want to speak for anybody or out of turn whenever I say this, but for me, as for myself, I walk in two different worlds. I have to, I got my side where I was born into. I was blessed to be a Cherokee. I was um, born into into a, a wonderful culture, a a people with a deep history, uh, despite how tragic or whatever happened in that history. And I'm also a product of this day and time. I'm also walking in a colonized manner. I'm walking in a, a manner that if I were to been a born back in the 17 to 1600s, I would think very alienated, but I am very comfortable um, in this in this walk. And one thing that I would say to these unborn babies is to be careful and to mind what you say, what you do, and to be careful to follow society because society tells us to do one thing mm -hmm. and majority of the time society is wrong society has us all jumbled up that's why there's such a divide today that's why there's there's unrest that's why there's lawlessness in our society and we've got to be careful with with such things because one we we think that we know best it's in our conscience it's in our it's in our our blood to to think that we know how to do this thing right and we know how to further on but I would say to look more in your spiritual side. I would say to look to God for guidance. In our culture, we believed in one God. In my belief now, I'm an independent fun fundamental Baptist. I still believe in God, but I also believe in Jesus Christ. And either way, God brought us here. God blessed us with life. God allowed us to be here in this meeting. God allowed us to do a lot of things that we take for granted. Just getting up in the morning and breathing. You know, simple things that we think that we can do just because, you know, it's how our body works. There is a... Uh, a verse in the book of James that talks about life being a vapor. It's gone, it's here one minute and then gone the next. And it's true. Today, we lost um, a man who has had a lot of knowledge in a lot of our, in our uh, old village places just suddenly. And then we lost a dear pastor, not uh, just Monday. Mm -hmm. Life is quick. Life's fleeting. And it's, it's, you need to be careful about who you follow, where you follow, and what you do and what you say. Because people are always watching. People are mm -hmm. looking at Mm -hmm. And they're going to say something the first time you step out of the line, the first time you make that mistake. They're going to look at you, and that's the thing that they're going to remember. Mm -hmm. It's always happened that way. Mm -hmm. If you choose to go with society, 
and do what society tells you to do, you're going to you're going to find yourself into a snare. You might get trapped and you won't find a way out. Mm -hmm. but be careful, mind where you step, because there ain't no telling what's just around that bend. And listen to other to the elder folks. Elder folks hold a lot of wisdom and learn from them. So that's that's about the best I can I can mm -hmm. say, the best I can I would give to somebody in the next generation to come. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for these reminders of what really matters in our work, whether we are in the academy, whether we are uh, in the town, whether we are in the countryside, whether we have uh, families or are having friends and to um, really sort through what our task is in this life and how to, how to be good role models. As you said, Matthew, you know, we are all being observed and watched. And I think the conference is an opportunity for us to think more deeply about these questions. And I think tonight was a really um, powerful opening of this difficult conversation. And um, I'm so glad, Matthew, we will see you tomorrow night again. Um, Andre, I hope you will stay with us in some form or another as well um, over the conference and definitely, definitely as we build on this conference because this is only a beginning. So thank you so much. It's, it's an honor to have all of you with us. I'm, I'm just very grateful. I really am. Thank so, you for all of your support uh, mm -hmm. has been um, very helpful you know, getting through all of this, this process and all of the emotions and, mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. ups and downs of, of, of pulling this information together and trying to figure out what story to tell, mm -hmm. how, you know, how to write something that can speak to all three cultures mm -hmm. in some way, uh, both, both truthfully and also on a positive light. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so thank you for your support. Mm -hmm. It's only the beginning, Andre. It's one step in a relationship that we, we will develop. So thank you so much to our participants. Um, we are coming now to a close. Um, and please join us again tomorrow afternoon. Um, there is a, a, a ritual tour of the American Indian um, objects that we have at the Museum of uh, so, um, Southern Decorative Arts. And after that, at three o'clock, we have a, a, another presentation about the, the missionary objects that the Moravians got from, from those they wished to convert, and really all over the world, and also including American Indian objects. And we will reflect on that um, at three o'clock with the Museum of Anthropology right here at Wake Forest, then we'll take a break. We'll all have something to eat. We will take a nap, me for sure. <laughs> and, and then, um, and I know Andre and I always joke, you know, we are big fans of nap takings <laughs> because yeah. we work so late yeah. at night. And then we will be refreshed and see each other for um, a panel with Matthew and also um, the Honorable Jack Baker from the National Trail of Tears Association and together we will have a conversation about the remembrance um, of, of the Cherokee Force removal. And it will be another very powerful evening, a very powerful day. So rest well, stay safe, and thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Everybody. So thank good you. night. Thank you good night. Be safe. Be safe. Thank you, Richard. Thank so you. be safe, everybody. And Grant is our technology guru, and he will know how to close us off. So good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. See you tomorrow. All right.